Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure being here and I have a, only 15 minutes, so I'll try to cover different issues, productivity, competitiveness, innovation, the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, give you some ideas about uh, productivity. What we say it's not everything, but in the long run, it's almost everything. Uh, competitiveness establishes the country standard of living. Innovation is the core of economic and social development. Now, how to increase productivity, how to increase competitiveness, and how to increase innovation? What are the factors affecting those issues? I'll start with productivity. And here, what are the main factors shaping productivity? Now, when we start with productivity, we start with the firm. And here, the prevailing view is the, comes from economics. And economists look at the firm as a closed box and to which you get some factors of production inputs and the outcome is the production of goods and the relationship between the output and the inputs it's what we define productivity but that's one perspective about productivity the other one is from management management does the opposite from what economics does it opens up it gets inside of the firm and there it's quite important what the general manager does how uh, the uh, incentives inside of the firm are provided, how decisions from top to down come, and so on. Now, also, uh, the firm is not isolated. It's within a country, and in the country prevails the institutions and especially regulations related to ecology and community. And the community nowadays has what we call the, uh, uh, the decision to, uh, how you call, uh, to, uh, to operate, uh, and I'll come later on into that. But uh, the other thing is we are now in the 21st century, and in the 21st century, it's quite important, the technology and innovation. And now we are coming into the fourth industrial revolution. And I'll stress that quite a, quite a lot. Uh, from the point of view of the policies, the technological policies being used for inside of the country, they are different according to what is the productivity level of the different firms. When you have low productivity firms, what you need is what's called extensionist policies. When you have medium productivity firms, you require technology transfer, and the firms that are on top, they do need support to innovate and to move forward the domestic the, uh, technological frontier. Okay, now let me go very quickly to competitiveness. And, and what's the most important thing I would like to stress is that nowadays, given the information that there is available, uh, Trinidad Tobago should improve its ranking in world competitiveness indexes. And I'll show where competi uh, Trinidad Tobago is located. And that's a comparison from 2006 with 2018, what has happened to international indexes rankings of Trinidad Tobago. And you see that there is a decrease in the global competitiveness index. There is a decrease, a deterioration in the ease of doing business. And there is a standby with the network readiness index and the corruption perception index that is quite at a high level in this country. Now, I think that more important than comparing what the country has done with respect to itself when you are in a global world, you should always compare with the top countries in the world. And here you see a comparison of the same indexes of, uh, of Trinidad Tobago with a Latin American country, the one on red, the Chilean country, 
and East Asian countries. They are doing something that we in Latin America have not done. And instead of looking inside of the region, we should look over there. And you can see how Malaysia is doing quite well in different types of uh, indicators and where we are doing quite bad in Latin America and Caribbean countries is on R&D and the capacity for innovation and how to critical thinking and how we do not have a good standard of education. And there, uh, prior to getting into that, the, where are we located now? And I think this is a good framework of stages of economic development that first we start with comparative advantage. And comparative advantage is the produ production of natural resources available in the country. And growth is generated by existing productive factors. And for that, you require political stability, macroeconomic equilibrium, institutions, and infrastructure. Second stage is competitive advantage. And there, you have to develop forward and backward linkages to the natural resources available in the country. And growth, in this case, is generated by efficiency and investment. And for that, you do need skilled human capital, financial markets, technological capability, and improving logistics. The third one is innovation. The third stage, innovation, and the fourth, industrial revolution. And there, you do need managerial sophistication and Schumpeterian managers. Let me go uh, very quickly on innovation. What's the engine of capitalism? And there, it's not what we think, price competition. It's what Schumpeter put it forward. The motor of capitalism is innovation. New firms substitute market firms, not by cutting prices, but by, with new original products that could be more expensive. And the best example is the relationship with the typewriter and the personal computer. The personal computer is not cheaper than the typewriter, but uses a superior and disruptive technology, and that makes the typewriter disappear. And that's what Schumpeter called creative destruction. Now, there is an innovation paradox. If all the information and knowledge are available in internet and Google, why all countries and firms are not together at the world innovation frontier? Why most innovation is done by large multinational firms belonging to developed countries? Why there is so little innovation in Latin American and Caribbean countries? And the answer is that there is a difference between information and knowledge. There exists a lot of information, but to take advantage of it, you require a minimum knowledge foundation. This is similar to the invention of the printing press. There were many published books in the world, but only learned people could read them at that time. Countries and firms are not together at the World Innovation Frontier because they have large differentials in technological and absorption capability. How do you acquire these capabilities? Okay, and here education is on the core of it. And the teaching education in Latin America and Caribbean is repetition, memory, solving known problems. Education required in the 21st century is solving unknown problems. How do you teach this? Who can teach it? Let me show to you how you are doing, how your 15-year-old students are doing at the PISA test of the OECD. Here you have the percentage of students below the minimum basic level at math, science, and reading. And you have over 50% of students that do not achieve the minimum basic level in math you have there 46% on science and in reading is 42%. But now look at how many good students are at the top level. And in Trinidad Tobago, only 2.5% of the students are at the top level of the PISA test 
in the math and it's zero really in science and look 2.4 percent in reading so you have to improve your quality of the education at high school at basic school and before at kindergarten and this is related to the last issue i want to put to you forward we live now in a new era new technology and innovation are transforming the world 4.0 technological future is here the goal is that not only trinidad tobago all countries all developing countries the growth strategy it should be connected to how to insert ourselves in the industrial revolution for 4.0 and here i this is a highly complex revolution it's not like the previous one and i in a try to suggest you to read that book by klaus schwab it's a short book 180 pages that he talks about the type of industrial revolution 4.0 where we are now and how difficult it is to understand the type of world in which we are and in this respect here you have an incomplete set of the new technologies autonomous ro robots simulation horizontal and vertical system integration the industrial uh, the industrial internet of things cyber security the cloud uh, additive manufacturing augmented reality big data analytics and look this is from bcg and they are missing technology 4.0 on that graph and what is missing artificial intelligence nanotechnology biotechnology all of that is happening now and you have to get to know them and how to use them in your productive uh, uh, process and let me put very quickly the differences between Latin America and the Southeast Asian countries. And I'll put imports of machinery. Look at the differences between our region and the Southeast Asia. In Latin America, machinery imports are considered like black boxes. And the firm's concern, the entrepreneurs, the only concern is where to plug the black box. What do Southeast Asian firms do. They open the black box to understand how it works and they apply reverse engineering to learn how to produce machine. And the stages they go through go from copy to innovation. And the first stage in Southeast is that they try to make equal quality of the good that the same to the original but at a lower price. In the second stage, creative imitation, implying higher quality than the original. The copy is better than the original product. And at the third stage, they are creating a new product. That's how you get innovation into a country. We are not doing that here in Latin America and Caribbean countries. And let me finish with what Angela Merkel put it year 2011 the urgency of Europe to get into the fourth industrial revolution. We have, that's exactly what she said, translated of course into English, we have to dominate quickly the mix of internet with industrial production to avoid that large USA digital platform firms take control of our industry. Germany has to transform its productive sector into a digitalized industry. For Trinidad Tobago and LAC countries, the future depends on the skill of the people and not on oil and gas. Let me finish here and <laughs> write and talk. <laughs> Thank you, Patricio. And that leads us right into the next segment we want to talk about, because this is a lovely theory to which we can build a background on. And no matter what you do, no matter what you put, even if you digitize, it's people, process, and technology that makes the overall change. 
And when we look at our sectors, and Andriana is going to walk through with us, looking at the different sectors we have, looking at the energy sector versus the rest, where are we comparing in terms of the rest of the world, in terms of productivity? Yes. Um, thank you, Maria. I'm going to retake one of the uh, phrases that um, Patricia used in his presentation, that uh, productivity is not everything, but in the long term, productivity is almost everything. And why is this? Because productivity is the main uh, driver of uh, per capita uh, GDP um, growth. And why does that matter? Because it's a standard measure of well-being in countries. And when we compare GDP uh, per capita in Trinidad to GDP per capita in the U.S., we find that it's almost 50% uh, lower. And uh, in order to convert to higher um, income per capita levels, what Trinidad needs to do is to increase productivity. That is actually the cause of almost 40% of that difference. When we see that there's a wedge in productivity, in labor productivity compared to that in the U.S., we ask ourselves, well, uh, why is this? Is this because uh, most firms are low productivity or is this because we have um, a misallocation of resources, namely that labor and capital are allocated in uh, sectors or firms that are low productivity instead of the high uh, productivity sectors. And what we find in the case of uh, Trinidad is um, that there's evidence of misallocation of resources. Actually, we have a, some sort of a, a, a dual economy. We have highly productive sectors, such as the energy sector, the mining uh, sector, actually the trade, the wholesale uh, trade and retail uh, sector and the hospitality sector, and to some extent, the finance uh, sector. But that uh, lives with very low productivity uh, sector. I mean, for instance, uh, the um, agriculture uh, sector, that is 60% uh, uh, labor productivity in the agriculture sector is 60% compared to that of labor productivity in the US. If we look at the uh, oil sector, it's 95%. It's almost as productive as the uh, energy sector in the US. So we have this huge difference. Another sector that is not very productive, that is 34% uh, of the productivity of the US is the manufacturing sector and also the transport sectors. And these are key sectors in the economy because a lot of the other sectors uh, take inputs from manufacturing to produce and also the transport sector, if in the future, Trinidad wants to expand its role in or the participation of tourism as a new emerging sector or, uh, um, the, um, or become some sort of a hub for uh, the Caribbean. It needs a more uh, efficient uh, transport uh, sector in the country. So these differences across sectors talk about what um, um, a, a certain misallocation of resources across sectors. Now, all these uh, uh, outcomes are the outcome of previous decisions of firms, and firms do not operate in an empty space. They operate in a, a somewhat institutional framework that uh, constrains or uh, make or facilitate their process of decision making. So there are certain factors that affect this outcome, but we're gonna address that later on. Thanks, Adriana. But when we talk about productivity, you know, we, we're talking about the labor aspect of it. And I mean, I've done some work with the manufacturing sector and it's about a culture of absenteeism. It's um, where most manufacturers are seeing they have to hire 30% more than what they need just to keep their production going. But we do have other factors that affect productivity. Ease of doing business is only, it's not only someone coming into the country to do business, but even amongst ourselves, getting approvals on time, um, making sure that you could set up the company, you could get your town and country approvals, all this adds to the ease of doing business. Coupled with the fact 
that we are faced with economies of scale. So our manufacturers have to be competitive enough where the export market is going to give them, you know, the economies of scale. Because the domestic market is just so big with 1.3 million people. Dr. Hele, when you think about, you know, the ease of doing business and public sector and how public sector reform could really change that. You know, I do agree with the Honorable Minister of Finance. It's easier said than done. But I do believe that there are some low-hanging fruit that we can really catch and change to start the process to make ourselves more competitive. What is your view in terms of public sector reform, where you see the 2030 vision in making that a reality? Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me just congratulate CAF on the 50th anniversary and for having this wonderful seminar in Trinidad and Tobago. We really value the partnership and we think this is this is something that would uh, carry us through later on. And thanks to the, to the panelists for setting an interesting stage. But I want, before I start on the institutional reforms, just, just to simplify and go back a little bit. When we talk about productivity, what do we mean? We simply mean production over factors of production, in this case, labor for the most part. Yep. So if you produce more with the same amount of labor, then your productivity goes up. Or you could produce the same amount and you have less labor, you use it more efficiently, and your productivity also goes up. It's important to get that concept uh, understanding, understandable. Now, what is it used for? First of all, we use it to figure out what sectors we are most uh, efficient in, where we can compete better, and where we have the best comparative advantage. It is also used for us to determine what are the rewards of the factors of production. In this case, we are talking about labor productivity. We are talking about wages. And that is quite important, because when you see wage determination, even in, in a, as the minister likes to talk about it, in IMF programs or, or so, a lot of it comes down to what is the, the appropriate reward for labor. And productivity is a main thing behind that. Now, looking at Trinidad and Tobago, our statistics are quite interesting. At the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, we measure productivity by looking at the index of, in, of industrial production or domestic production over the index of uh, man hours worked. The latest statistics from the CSO show that uh, between 2017 and 2018, there was a 13.4% increase in productivity in the non-energy sector which is quite interesting and remarkable. When we add the energy sector and we look at overall, it goes down to about 9.4% because we had some, some issues in the energy sector there. Now, but when you look behind that, and if, if you see what I talked about before, production, man hours work, you actually saw that between that period, 17 and 18, man hours work actually declined by 1.2%. So it means that we were becoming more efficient and utilizing less labor to produce. And this is quite fascinating. It gets even starker when you look at it uh, between March 2018 and March 2019. The statistics show that, that man hours work actually declined by 5.5%. So we have that as, as a backdrop. When we look and, and, and um, more, Patricio talked about the um, comparison with Latin America and the Caribbean. When we looked at it comparatively, it was difficult to get statistics, but I was able to use the International Labor Organization's um, website. They have some things that use a model and they get um, productivity indicators. And all productivity between 18 and 19, because they model it so that they have uh, uh, an index for 2019 already, is 3.4% increase in productivity which is actually quite good because the, the world uh, estimates are 2.7% and Latin America and the Caribbean, 1.5%. So we stack up quite, quite nicely in, in that regard. But as I will be mentioning afterwards, there are some things that we need to talk about behind that. And let me just get into your part about the, the solutions. I think there are four sets of institutional reforms that we need to take quite seriously in try, trying to boost uh, production. The first, it might seem basic, but is on the statistical front. 
I think if we are serious about understanding what is happening on the labor market and in productivity, we need to get our statistics much better. Our labor statistics are dated. We have 2018 statistics. Even our production indicators that I, I talked about, what we use at the central bank, the two, in, the two indices, their base year is 1995. This is quite outdated, so we need to do that. I know there's some work on, a, and the central bank had to appear before a joint select committee some time ago on statistics reform. We need to make that more, um, to move more rapidly because there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, in 2018, there was the International Conference of Labor Statisticians. Unfortunately, we weren't there, but it was it's a, something that is quite important for, for many countries. And they, at that seminar, they gave out a number of new guidelines, which I think would be interesting for us. One is on migration statistics. How do you incorporate migration statistics, and particularly in our context? Another one was on forced labor. Another one was on labor and cooperatives. And then the final one was on the juxtaposition between skills and qualifications and employed uh, laborers. So I think the first aspect is statistics, because if we don't have that, we can't be able to understand where we are. The second uh, reform would be on the educational front, because we need to understand what is happening. Unfortunately, or well, I mean, it is a factor of life that the small and medium enterprises tend to have a big role in, in, um, in labor and in, in economies, including in Trinidad and Tobago. But because of market failures, they don't have the understanding and the education to be able to improve their productivity. They may not have access to finance. They may not have understanding of how to do business plans. They may not know the markets in which they should go, how to, to navigate the the, um, the customs, excise, all this sort of thing. So the education is important, and I think that needs to be broad-based. The schools need to, to, to pr promote efficiency, the universities, the central bank is working to help, help them uh, do business plans and so, but the education is important and the incentives for that. The third thing, I think, is on the, the HR function, the human resources function, because Ultimately, productivity of labor depends on the engagement of staff. They need to feel that they are part of an, an enterprise, an institution, a business, to be able to contribute. So I think the, the human resource function must not just focus on you know, the, the numbers, the sick leave, the different, all the things, but how do you get engaged staff? The fourth aspect, institutional reform, is not an institution per se, but it's really a partnership between the unions and businesses, this union business partnership, because I think it must be a win-win situation where workers see themselves as part of a bigger picture where to the extent that the business does well, productivity improves, everything goes better, then they are more engaged and they also have a better um, uh, reward. So, so I think that is, is a fundamental part of it. There's a lot of... Um, studies that show that the more engaged staff that you have, the more productive they are, and the more that they will get better. So the union labor, the union, sorry, union business relationship, I think, you would focus necessarily on wage negotiations, but still focus on health and safety, on working conditions, on improving on joint solutions to, to get the businesses better. And I think this is just some of, some of the, the thoughts. Those four, four reforms, I think, could help in Trinidad and Tobago. So based on what you're saying is the environment is what's going to drive this change. Having an environment where employees feel engaged, they feel part of the bigger picture, and all those nice things. Yes, this is part of it. But and, we and, could and have I, you right. know, reforms at, at the front that the government will uh, statistics to complement that. So you talked a little bit about the unions, and I just, I don't want to dwell too much into that. And, you know, unions obviously had a place and a time. And, you know, there's a they saying. They have a place and a time. They have a place and a time. And, you know, <laughs> what got you to one place isn't necessarily the same strategy to get you further. Yes. So the partnership that you're talking about, I mean, don't you think that, yes, the environment, of course, is important, but a pay-for-performance type structure 
would drive productivity further. So a lot of the private businesses have incentives, bonuses. Um, is this something that you see could work in a public sector environment? Certainly, the, the, the problem with that potentially is the statistics, because measuring output of services could be very difficult. You know, but you, so if you're producing cars, you're producing shoes or tables, or so, you could know how much. If you're doing services and you want to know how satisfied your customers are, it may be more difficult. But I think there is still a lot of, a lot of work to do in measuring those and making it more scientific. Because you can um, calibrate some of these by having, let's say, um, satisfaction surveys or output, how many people did you serve today, how long did it take. So there is some work to be done in that. So a, 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 a balance of both, more statistics and more awareness of, of the output. So you see big data and managing big data as a huge part of transformation. Indeed. Based on what you're saying. On that basis, I want to kind of roll into Andreas. In terms of innovation and how you see innovation driving transformation. And I want to look at it from a, a few different perspectives. Innovation, you know, we're fearful of automation because people are fearful of jobs. But there has been just as many jobs created as lost in the digital era. How do we see digital transformation, not only in public sector, but in companies, to do exactly what you're saying, Dr. Hille, which is to engage employees Meaning automation moves you from the paper pushing to the critical thinking that Patricia spoke about. How do we get critical thinkers is to really move away from doing the routine task and using our brains more. So how do you see innovation in that area? Well, uh, first, thank you for the invitation and, and congratulations to CAF for the anniversary. Glad to be here. <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, before addressing your, your, your question, I, I, I want to say a couple of things about uh, innovation in, in, in countries which are dependent on commodities, because I, I think this is a common challenge for most, many of our countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. We have been thinking about this for many years. And uh, I think that in, 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 in the 60s or the, or the 70s or the 50s, uh, there was the idea that natural resources uh, activities were not prone to innovation. Well, they were low tech uh, activities, which uh, very few uh, opportunities for innovation, and that they created uh, very few linkages with other sectors. Uh, nowadays, I think that we, we see things in a very different manner, and we see that many uh, in, in natural resources activities are, uh, are, are going through a, a a wave of technological innovations that create a lot of opportunities, uh, and the oil, gas, and sect the oil and gas sector is obviously an example, but also agriculture. Adriana talked about agriculture and the, uh, the backward the productivity uh, uh, gap uh, between Trinidad and Tobago and other countries. Uh, for instance, you have precision agriculture, smart farming, precision agriculture, which is using drones and artificial intelligence and GPS and satellite images for improving productivity. And uh, so those, that changes everything. And that has a lot to do with the, Patricio saying about the, in, in the, uh, the fourth industrial revolution. Industry 4.0. There's, so, there's also agriculture 4.0, and and, uh, and, um, I, and I think that this also has to do with the productive diversification because that creates opportunities for local suppliers of technologies, goods and services, and inputs for agriculture, oil and energy, etc. I, I know that Trinidad Tobago in the past has been trying to uh, create that kind of linkages, for instance, through local minimum local content uh, programs. Uh, perhaps uh, that need to be complemented with other things about, uh, for instance, creating capabilities, education, etc. And, and addressing your question, I, I think that uh, the, uh, the challenge is uh, is very is very demanding because I come from the university and nothing is more. I think that very few institutions in the world are are are, are harder to change than the university because we. Uh, 
well, we have been here for uh, for hundreds of uh, of years. We are uh, with the with the church. I think we are the most uh, the oldest institutions in the world. And uh, you you hear uh, you hear you hear a lot about changing the way uh, you teach and changing the ways uh, the, um, uh, uh, you you communicate information and knowledge to the students. But these are since that are easier to, uh, said than done, like the minister mm -hmm. said uh, before. No, the, this is, it's easier to say that you need to change, but it's, it's, it's hard to, to, to know how, you, <laughs> in which direction you, you need to change and how to change. I think that uh, in, in this regard, we need to uh, rethink how, uh, um, how the educational system interacts with other parts of the, of the society. I think that most of the educational system is very closed and uh, uh, it speaks, it talks with itself, and uh, it, there are a few linkages with uh, the firms and, uh, and the, the, the rest of the government and uh, uh, civil society organizations. And um, be, because I think that we need to address those chal the challenge you, you mentioned, the challenge of uh, dealing with the uh, opportunities and challenges of automation, how to involve workers in, in innovation in this, this new era, we need to address them at the very start of their educational uh, involvement. From, uh, in, in many countries, like for instance Korea, they are teaching programming at the kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they are starting, uh, they're starting very early. Uh, but, that's, uh, but if you speak with entrepreneurs in, and, and firms in Latin America, they also will tell you, they will also tell you that you need to uh, combine those uh, hard, uh, hard uh, competencies like uh, programming, with other soft, softer competencies like uh, interacting with other people and uh, uh, working in groups and uh, uh, flexi flexibility. I think that those uh, those competencies are even harder to to, to teach because they, are, they you, you you may have a manual for teaching programming for. To, to young people, but uh, how to how to move from from to this culture where soft skills will be increasingly needed? I think that's a that's a very de uh, uh, demanding challenge. But uh, uh, the last thing I, I, I want to stress is that uh, innovation is an uncharted sea, like Schumpeter said, like decades ago. So. Uh, I, I, I don't mean that you won't, that you don't, that uh, you cannot uh, make any kind of forecasts, but uh, I think that the uh, forecasts are, are, are more, uh, are, 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 uh, the they, uh, forecasts often fail. So uh, instead of saying, well, the world is going there, and uh, for instance, it, 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 those kinds of jobs will be lost, and uh, the, because uh, someone made uh, some some uh, study uh, about the probability of losing jobs in that sector or gaining jobs in another sector, I think that the most important thing is to be flexible and and to create competencies that can move across sectors. Mm -hmm. you, you cannot make a bet to say believing in Osborne and Frey predictions about uh, which which jobs will be lost because th that's going that's not going to happen exactly that way. You, but creating, I, I think that the, the, the economic and the educational system of the society needs to create competencies that can move across sectors, that can be useful, useful in, a, in, in a bunch of activities that you, we don't know uh, which, which they are because they don't si exist uh, still. But uh, I think that uh, this kind of thing is, is perhaps the, the most important thing for me, creating competencies that can be useful in many sectors and, uh, and workers can move uh, across sectors, as they as, as um, more jobs opportunities uh, are created in, in places which uh, we still don't we don't know how, which they will be, but uh, surely uh, they, we will live in a in a world where transformation will be permanent, and we need to to be flexible and the have the capacity to adapt to those changes. Thank you, but you know, listening to you, I'm thinking better said than done sounds even <laughs> harder now. Because changing the education system is not something you can do overnight. And I think when we think about diversification, totally agree with the Minister of Finance, it has become a buzzword. And you can't wake up tomorrow morning and diversify. It takes mm. steps to build the ecosystem. Mm. As you were saying, Dr. Hale, if we move into entrepreneurship, you have to have the whole ecosystem to support the entrepreneurs, which is finance, 
you know, knowing how to do business, the education system. We talked about changing the education system, not something you can do easily. But other countries have done it. Um, when I think of our GDP per capita, we're almost the same as Chile. And we like to point out certain countries and say, oh, but they did it, that's an exception, and this is an exception. But what have these countries done to get it done? So maybe we could talk a little bit, Patricio, about Chile and what Chile did and how they have been able to consistently have one goal in mind from president to president about economic growth. I think, like Andres said, that we have to start with the small children. We have to teach them how to be creative. Creativity, now, it's a key factor for innovation. And in that respect, uh, we have to see some of the biases or errors we have had in the way education was thought. We have been thinking that it's enough to teach the three R's for, to students, writing, reading, and arithmetic, okay? And we thought that if they learn that, automatically, they would know how to think. It's not so. It doesn't happen that way. I mean, look at what Socrates was doing 2,500 years ago. Who was teaching young people who didn't know how to read or write. And he was teaching them how to think. And that's something, uh, it's, it's a pity to say, we don't do it even in our universities. Mm -hmm. So that's something we have to, there is a paradigm change in education. We are moving from teaching to learning. And that's like a, an astronomic change from Ptolemaeus to Copernicus, that in teaching, the teacher is the center of the class. And he does all the talking. And the students writing what he says and no questioning of what he is saying. With learning, you shift, you're shifting who is the center inside of the classroom. And that goes directly into the students. And I would say that when in a class, whatever, high school, basics, or university, the teacher speaks more than 50% of the time, he's not doing the job of trying their students to learn. And the students can learn. You have to teach them how to ask relevant questions. You have five years old children asking what seems to be silly questions. Keep asking them, why do you do that? I mean, that's what Socrates was doing, okay? But you have to go further. Uh, you have somehow to, uh, and in, that, in this respect, I mean, there is one big advantage of being a less developed country. We can copy what the developed countries have done. In the USA, they have manuals of how to teach creativity and how to teach critical thinking 30 years ago. So, and you have the advantage that they are in English, we have to translate them into Spanish in Latin America. So, you, if you look at them, I mean, it's highly interesting what they, the way they teach six, seven years old children how to think and using thinking as the way to learn. And that's a key factor that goes into the firms where something that I miss, I mean, with Andres, we are at the university, there is a missing link between enterprises and universities. I mean, it's a completely broken linkage there. 
That shouldn't be that way. That we should be connected. I mean, when we get into the fourth industrial revolution, you need people that understand what's going on there in this mix between the digital world and the physical world. Why it's important nowadays to introduce this digital world into the productive process because you do changes in real time and you improve the way how things are being produced in real time and that's the way how you increase productivity. So that's something that you need a full innovation change in how we have done things up to now. And you have to put innovation in the, as the main goal to be discussed. And the whole society has to be innovating. I mean, okay. that's okay. what in developed countries are talking about, the uh, learning society, the innovation society. And in, when we look at the, the question you were asking with respect to teaching, Vietnam started the, to take the PISA test only on to, uh, 2012, seven years ago. And they did incredibly well right away. And Vietnam has a fifth, one fifth of the income per capita that you do. How can they do, I would say, 30% better than you are doing? And there, it's a mix of what you learn at school and how the family is involved in the learning of their students. The family is involved and the family, it's not only involved, it learns what the students are learning. And that's something that, uh, how you change? Uh, then the question we say in my country, oh, it's culture. The Asians are different to we Latins. It's not so. It's not so. I mean, it, we do not, uh, I would say, innovation. It's not on the, on the genes. Yeah. So you innovation is a, that. it's a culture. It's yeah, what true. you're saying. So we have true. to have an innovative culture. Well, I would, you know, have to say that I do think we have an innovative culture. We created the steel plan. We create many things. I work with many young entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs, and we are a creative society. But where I will agree with you is I think we extract that creativity and we don't build it through the education system. So, Dr. Hele, you know, this was coming straight at you. <laughs> In terms of, and, and, you know, we've gone a little bit off, but we're trying to get to the root of why haven't we been able to do what we say we want to do? Given, if I look at your model, on the comparative analysis, we're there. Strong GDP per capita, political stability. I don't think you will find many countries in the world with our diversity that lives happily together. That in itself is a strength. So Dr. Hale, if you think about our education system, and if we had to do what we're speaking here on this, on this panel about really driving innovation at the core culture, do you think that is a humongous task or it, it can be done and should it be done? Yes, it can be done completely. I think we have the capacity we have the, certainly have the intellectual capacity. We have the charm. We, ha we are very charming people. We have the creativity. We do things a certain way. And I think there is a lot of, a lot within us that makes it possible. I think sometimes we, we may second guess ourselves too much and say, well, maybe I'm doing something wrong. I have to look at the international standard. But no, we have to be more confident, move things forward and get things along. And I mean, the kind of things that we get involved in, and, and we are a small country, we are surrounded by big countries, we are, you know, internet savvy, we have our businessmen connected everywhere. We know a lot of what we have to do, and we are doing it. I mean, that's one example, our approach to time. Where we have a, a fluffy approach to time, I must, you know, in Trinidad and Tobago, if I want to put it that way. So, so when Kitchener in 1971 said, any time is Trinidad time, but no, things, things could change. I remember I learned it the hard way recently when I went to, um, to the Big Five um, steel ban the other day. And they said it was 6.30. 
So I said, well, 6 30, well, that means 7 or something. So, <laughs> so I turned up duly about 7 o'clock. And I missed, you know, part of the best band, which is All Stars, which is everybody. Right? But the thing is that they started exactly on time. They didn't have a history of it, but it started exactly on time. And now I learned, next time I'll go half past five, I'll be there, right? So we have the capacity to do it. Sometimes we second guess ourselves, sometimes we may think so and so, but we could do it and we, we see it. And when we have to perform, we do perform. And I think there is a lot of hope. I think this seminar, I think the other things that we've been hearing about, um, you know, gives me a lot of confidence in our capacity to move things along. Thank you. I want to just get back a little bit to the diversification and the sectors, right? So we've talked about some of the root causes, education, getting more innovation, driving change. Hopefully all of that will also change the ease of doing business as everybody falls in line with some discipline. But if we had to look at what can we be competitive in? In other words, we have the comparative advantage the next step, of course, is a competitive advantage. We can't be all things to all men. If we're really looking at diversification, and I'm opening this up to the panel, to whichever one wants to, to you know, tune in here as we have just a few minutes left. If we had to go about choosing which sectors we should invest in and how we choose those sectors, given we don't have an unlimited supply of resources, how does one go about really working through what can I compete with the rest of the world and do that effectively? How do we choose those sectors so that when we're looking at investment, when we're looking at the education system, when we're looking at the financing, when we look at the development of the human resources, it is with a focused approach? Andreas, go ahead. No, I think it's a very difficult task. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, perhaps uh, many people know about the Asian experience. The, it, it's been, the, they call it picking winners. I think it's a bad name because I, I think that you, you, you get the impression that you know in advance which will, be, which will, be, which will be able to win. So, and you pick them uh, from, from scratch. And that's, that's not what happened there, I think. Uh, I think that it's a, it's a, it's a process of uh, some continuous transformation. And first of all, you need to start from something that you have. Mm -hmm. You cannot create, create sectors from nothing. You cannot uh, create, I, I don't know, uh, if you don't have a base, a knowledge base, a firm space, you, you, you cannot uh, create a sector from scratch. And uh, so first thing, the first thing for me is to start from the, 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 the sectors in which you have knowledge and capabilities like uh, Hausmann and Hidalgo uh, and, uh, metaphor mm -hmm. about the uh, monkeys and trees. So you, you have some monk you have some trees and you have some monkeys firms and you the, the firms the, the firms can, can jump from tree to tree if they have some knowledge and capacity which are, are useful for the new challenge for to move into another sector. And this is about discovery also. This is how you need to discover which are the opportunities and you need to get you, you need to address that in a competitive way between firms and the state, because firms know, know, know a lot of things uh, about the microeconomic, uh, 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 microeconomic dimension that they know about the market, and the uh, public sector knows which are the goals and the, the objectives, and so if you bring them together, you can uh, facilitate that process of discovery with the, uh, with the help of experts from the university and uh, uh, civil society. So I think that the, the second, Second thing is to, to, to make it to a competitive process between private and the public sector. And finally, I think that you you should uh, again. I, 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 would, I, I would stress the thing. The, the, this thing. You. I, 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 I think that uh, you cannot talk about sectors anymore. You, you, you talk about value chains. So uh, you need to create capabilities in tasks which are maybe useful for many different value chains. For instance, think about software. Software is it's not a sector. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a cross-cutting technology. It's a, it's a general process technology. So if you, if, if you have good software programmers and good software firms, they can serve many many firms, many, many type of sectors, many type of consumers. 
So I, I, I think that that's, we are not in the, in, the, in the age of the Korean industrial policy mm. where you can say, well, I'm going to invest to the steel sector, to the automotive sector. That's not how industrial the production and trade is organized today. And you, I think that you must, uh, you must uh, stress uh, the, the uh, you must, uh, so what do you mean? Uh, turn on my, <laughs> my microphone. You, mu you must uh, <laughs> stress the, the value chain approach and the ta uh, and, and and try to move up to to move upwards in the value chain uh, yeah. and go to to tasks uh, uh, of higher complexity. For instance, from call centers to business process outsourcing and and so that, uh, I think it's the first the discovery and discovery from things you 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 already know and you already have. Second, private-public partnerships. Third, third, not thinking about sectors, but of stages and tasks in value chains. Adriana. Yes, I wanted to um, uh, add something to uh, what Andres was, uh, was, was mentioning. When one thinks about diversification, the Asian experience actually comes to mind. But the thing is that they actually used the resource that they had in abundance, which was cheap labor. And that is not something that we have in Latin America, nor in the Caribbean, where uh, we cannot compete in those terms and we cannot start in that process at this point. So you, we have to think uh, first in what we have and what we can develop. And uh, I think that it's hard to conceive the economy of, of Trinidad and Tobago without the oil sector. The oil sector will continue to be an important chunk for the economy, but that doesn't mean that other interesting sectors cannot uh, 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 be born and prosper. And in terms of that process of self-discovery that Andres uh, mentioned, I mean, for instance, one can think of a sector that has been interesting and emerging in the uh, last uh, 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 in recent times, which is the cocoa uh, sector, which mm -hmm. is uh, interesting in other countries as well. And what does that sector potentially need to prosper even more? Well, become perhaps more competitive in terms of the exchange rate. I mean, the exchange rate, an appreciated exchange rate, and this is something that happened in Latin America during the boom, but it has extended for a little longer uh, in, uh, in, in Trinidad, it hinders competitiveness of the export sector. It's not a goal in itself. I mean, it's that is what needs, uh, it, it's a condition that perhaps is needed for uh, uh, some sectors to uh, prosper, but also access to quality inputs. I mean, most sectors here work with either um, um, manufacturers produced here or imported goods. And if there are restrictions on acquiring those uh, um, uh, exchange uh, 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 resources, that there's going to be a problem. And also, in order to produce and export something, you need the adequate infrastructure. And when you compare a country with an equivalent GDP per capita, I mean, in the case of Chile, you see that Trinidad outperforms every the average uh, Latin American uh, uh, and Caribbean country in terms of uh, all the dimensions of the global competitiveness uh, index, including infrastructure, but then underperforms in every dimension, the country that is comparable in terms of GDP per capita with it, with its Chile. So if you don't have the adequate ports, if you don't have the adequate roads to carry those goods and export them, then it's not going to be, uh, the, the, the sector is going to stagnate. And that is something that you see in other sectors in agriculture that is more devoted to subsistence agriculture. And that is something that could also with another uh, setting, I mean, for instance, the, um, the size of the land held by each producer that is rather small on average here in Trinidad, that is something that could be addressed as well in order to boost productivity in this sectors uh, that could uh, prosper in the future. Dr. Hilly, what is, let me just, you wanted to, Say something. You wanted me to say something. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm, you know, what yeah, no, want, no, I'm we have a few minutes, so I just want to, you know, just focus it a little bit. You know, we talk about what we're good at, right? 
So, you know, our last entrepreneurial program, it was chocolate and music, which I think are indigenous to us, something that we can own and build. What is your perspective in terms of the sectors that you think can really add value to our sustainable growth? I, I would start more broadly by tagging on to what Andreas was said. I don't think we should be picking winners in the sense that saying, well, you do this, you do that, you do the other. So like, let's say somebody has five children, you say, okay, the smart one will be a doctor and a lawyer, and the slow one will be a central bank governor. <laughs> I don't know. So, so you, you create the permissive conditions, you create the education, you create the, the capacity to think, to learn, to, 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 to be able to manipulate um, situations, to maneuver, uh, to be flexible. And naturally, some things will rise up. So in, the, in our case, we have some comparative advantages. We, have the, we are blessed with, with the energy sector. And we have to utilize that. We have good cocoa. We have certain talents. And so, so I think once you create those conditions, the, the, the best will rise up. So I think we have capacity in a, in a lot of areas. Clearly, sometimes you need help. Just like the child would need help, maybe the extra school work or, or, or lessons or so. The state, the institutions, the banks, the central banks help out to make sure that, that there's support in, in different areas. But I think there's a lot that we could be uh, open to. And, and uh, I think we should be quite flexible in, in where we go. So certainly on the tourism front, we have great, um, as I say, people, uh, culture, natural resources, ecosystems that anybody would be attracted to. We have the cocoa. So I, I, I would be more flexible as opposed to, to trying to bottling it into certain um, categories. One yeah. last question, and then Patricio, you'll close us off. One last question. Do you think that our reliance on the energy sector, and this might be an ob obvious answer, has really stopped us from innovating in all those other areas? So how do we balance that? Our energy sector has to be, you know, that's not going to go away. That's our mainstay, if you want to call it that. But, you know, when I look at other economies that have transformed, it has been a crash and burn sort of situation. We've been saved from that crashing and burning. So, you know, do you think in one short sentence, because I want Patricia to close off, do you think, you know, that question, has it really been a blessing and a hamper? I think it has been a blessing. It has given us the potential to do a lot of things. But sometimes when we have a lot going, we may hold back on doing other things. So I think now that we have a situation that we have to deal with, perhaps this helps us to, to be creative once more. Great. Patricio. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking that maybe uh, you should have one uh, general goal and, and stress a, a country goal where I think everyone will agree. And I think that Latin America and, and the Caribbean countries have, have to insert themselves into the fourth industrial revolution. If they don't do, it would be equivalent to not having been connected to internet since the 1990s. Where, we, where will this society, this, the productive sectors here will be? Could they be competitive? Imagine if you do, wouldn't have internet. When you try to do something at the financial system, at the bank, and they say to you, the system is down, everything is stopped. So I would say that somehow digitalization, it's a must that the whole country, the whole population has to become digital. And that means that, okay, you need, a, I would say, a roadmap, how to insert into the fourth industrial revolution, how to digitalize the whole country. How do, why don't we have digital governments? digital state, all the public services should be online 
and everyone can access that there in an instant way. If that's something that some countries are doing already, and in the natural resource area. So I would say, I, I would say that uh, the way I, I put it here is that smart wave, the smart web should be available to all, including the rural, rural areas. And we do need an ubiquitous uh, information, communication, technology society where everyone can use computers and cell phones everywhere all the time. That's something we, I, I think we could agree, we should agree, uh, in order to be competitive in this global world. If we don't do it, you know, we have to be looking for another planet where we will be looking, living, and we don't know the technology how to get there. So I think it's easier to try to get into this fourth industrial revolution to understand what it means and how to get there soon. Thank you. And our time is up, so I want to thank the panel for the insight and great discussion. And on closing, better said than done, it seems we have to do it digitally. <laughs> so I look forward to the, to the other panel and hope that you all benefited from the insights today. Thank you. Definitely a very insightful conversation with many valuable and practical takeaways. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point in time, 